good afternoon, fellow surfers and researchers and distinguished guests. My name is Nina Kim, Managing Editor of the International Theme and Amusement Park Journal and Society. And I will be serving as your moderator today. Our second annual International Theme and Amusement Park Society conference has begun. Since this is our only second conference, most of you might not be familiar with the conference. I will briefly explain it to you. And okay, so our ITEPS conference launched last year to learn more about the theme and amusement park business and academic insights from industry players throughout the world. Until now, we have published two books in December and in March. And if you have uh go into our website you can see this is our second book published in march and all speakers today will be given a priority opportunity to publish on our june edition of the book and the conference of today is being sponsored and held at wave park the korea's world largest surf park but unfortunately the covid19 pandemic has prevented us from having an in-person conference, but we truly hope you will get to enjoy Wave Park in the future. At this time, I would like to introduce the chairman of ITEP's conference, Mr. Choi Samsop. He has run his company, Day One Plus Group, for 21 years and has expanded his business from real estate sector to theme park, which resulted in the successful launch of uh, the first marine cable car in the country and the largest man-made surf park in the world. However, due to his business obligations, he will be sharing a pre-recorded welcome address. 세계 테마 파크 학회 회원 여러분, 참석자 여러분 반갑습니다. 세계 테마 파크 학회 회장 최삼섭입니다. 두 번째 세계 테마 파크 학회를 시흥 웨이브 파크에서 개최하게 되어 매우 기쁘게 생각합니다. 메인 후원사인 웨이브파크에 감사 인사를 전하며 학회장인 건만우 교수에게 감사를 전합니다. 웨이브파크는 경기도 시흥에 위치한 세계 최대 아시아 최초 인공서핑장과 레크레이션 웨이브풀을 갖춘 파크이며 2021년 세계 테마파크의 학회 개최와 학회 지발관을 지원하고 있습니다. 이번 학회의 주제는 인공 서핑장과 관광입니다. 서핑 파크와 관광 산업의 새로운 트렌드를 논의하기 위해 발표자들을 특별히 초청하였습니다. 참가하신 여러분들은 국내외 전문가들의 지식을 습득하고 공유할 좋은 기회가 될 것입니다. 또한 ITEPS 학회는 학회 회원들이 토론을 통해 국제적인 시각을 공유하는 데 목적이 있습니다. 전문가들의 지식과 역량을 함께 논의하고 토론하는 자리를 마련하게 되어 기쁘게 생각합니다. 발표와 토론이 끝난 후에는 우수 논문 시상 등이 준비되어 있으며 마지막까지 자리를 함께 해주시길 바랍니다. 오늘 학회 참석을 통해 좋은 네트워킹의 기회를 갖기를 바랍니다. 참석해 주신 여러분들께 감사를 드립니다. 감사합니다. 시작. 세계. Thank you, Chairman. Sorry for. Sorry. 나가. Oh, is it? Oh, sorry. Okay. Stop here. Okay. 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 Thank you, Chairman Tori, for the welcome address. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items. Uh, as Chairman Tori has mentioned, that our main sponsor, Wave Park, has is presenting you with a gift at the end of the conference. 
Therefore, we would appreciate it if you stay until the end of this panel discussions. And you will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions in this conference room. And you may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. Now, moving along to our session, uh, session of the keynote speaker. Please welcome Mr. Philip Cuddy, who will be presenting us on wave parts and self therapy. Philip, would you start? Sure. Um, it's nice to meet everybody. My name is Philip Cuddy. Um, I'm in California right now. And I came to the wave park uh, earlier this year. And a lot of things that I've done in my life have paralleled what's happening at the wave park. I've been surfing for 52 years. I'm one of the people that may be the first person to surf in Korea in 1991. And also in 1991, we started a um, therapy camp for kids with cancer. And we did that at Leo Carrillo State Beach in um, uh, West Malibu in California. And we worked with the California State Parks and Ronald McDonald House and uh, our own club was the Malibu Board Riders Club. And we started this club specifically to work with these kids with cancer. And so what I'm talking about today is my own experience. I worked with the camp, I helped fund it, I helped um, organize it for 12 years. The program lasted for 25. So my personal experience, um, with my medical background experience working at the University of Hawaii Biomed Lab. And I worked on box jellyfish sting treatment there. And so after reading Una's paper, I decided that I could help develop a proof of concept. And that proof of concept is for uh, therapy from wave parks We've always done it in the ocean. And there are certain things that Una wrote about, having a controlled environment, um, having a consistent environment, actually is a better platform uh, for developing a therapy program. And so uh, for day one plus to create this wave park uh, was amazing to me, you know, because 30 years ago, uh, when I went to Korea, my surfboards got uh, confiscated at the airport because nobody had seen surfboards before they'd seen windsurfers. So to come back 30 years later and see what actually is the, the best wave park in the world, I surfed in it. I didn't surf in it very well, but uh, it uh, really is a good development. And so specifically what Una wrote about was PTSD. Uh, post-traumatic uh, stress disorders. Um, and so what I worked on to begin with was actually just playing therapy for kids. One of the things that we did um, to create this camp was to get these kids to a place where they weren't bullied. They, everybody in the camp had to have cancer or be in remission. And we had uh, probably 250 campers and we had pretty much one-on-one. -on -one. Um, there's a presentation that uh, um, you can access from the website later uh, and it'll show you uh, the extent of what we went to. Um, towards the end, um, we actually attached a wheelchair uh, backing to a surfboard so we could get kids in wheelchairs into the water, into the surf. Now, from that experience and my own hands-on experience and with the feedback we got from the oncologist at Children's Hospital, which is our other partner, I knew these kids were affected. When we started the camp, I think six out of 10 kids died from cancer. When we ended the camp, mostly because of the 
ad, the um, advancement in treatment and technology, it turned out that seven out of 10 kids survived. Some of the oncologists said the will to live was increased by the experience that these kids had in the ocean. Now, our experience with these kids included kayaking, um, touch tanks with uh, um, sea anemones and other sea urchins and other uh, near shore um, marine life. And also the kids that couldn't stand up, that couldn't, so we took them boogie boarding or we took them in a kayak and fish would swim up to the kayak, seals would swim up to the kayak. So that's an experience that um, is specific to the ocean. But the actual surfing, which you know can be done so easily at the wave park, was the biggest uh, probably change in the way these kids felt about themselves and felt about the world, and you know experiencing this new uh, stoke of life and nature that they would never have. Now, all of these things transfer over into. Uh, the treatment for PTSD and focusing on the program that the Wave Park um, is looking into with firefighters. There's specific tests that have been developed by the Navy, the United States Navy, um, and the reports are, are uh, readily available for their uh, investigations. Most of these are exploratory investigations. They're not what I want to design, which would be basically a proof of concept clinical trial. And when I worked with the biomed lab at the University of um, Hawaii, I designed the uh, clinical trials for testing our treatment of stings. And that whole uh, testing was so much more uh, invasive and you know, getting stung by a box jellyfish, which you know, in some senses could be fatal. You know, this kind of clinical trial and test that um, can be run at the wave park would be nothing as drastic as what we had to develop. And there was nothing at all uh, to be compared to. Um, I had to start from scratch. But what I found after reading Una's paper and following some of the references that she had, I found three different kinds of tests that we could put together and um, collaborate with some of the groups that are working at the medical institutes in Korea. There is a group at Inha University. There's also a group at Yonsei University. And I'm sure there's other colleges that are studying, specifically studying PTSD for firefighters. One of the reasons that it's important in Korea is because of what they're looking into is the suicide rate. The suicide rate for Korean firefighters is um, extraordinarily high. The suicide, unfortunately, the suicide rate for Korea is extraordinarily high. I think it's overall number four in the world. So there's a lot of factors that cause stress. Um, and so in some of these investigations that have gone on before, um, the ones in surfing, for example, in San Luis Obispo, you have to decide whether, what is the therapy? Is the therapy actually the surfing part? Is it the camaraderie where people that have PTSD and usually are by themselves get together with other people? Is it the physical exertion? So there's a lot of different variables that have to be uh, considered and data has to be collected to come up with a definitive answer. I'm 95% sure that there is a definitive answer and that there's the answer is that the uh, wave parks will offer um, a better format for therapy than ocean waves would. Plain example, there was days when we went to the water where there was no waves at all. There's days that we went down to the beach and it was too big, you know? So what Una pointed out that they can control the waves, they can control the environment, they can control the, the temperature of the water. 
those things are all key. They're key to the treatment. They're key to the investigation. Um, there's tests that they do on brain size and brain function. It has to do with the hippocampus and the amygdala and your frontal cortex. So there's actual scientific measurements of how surfing, uh, taking risks, uh, adrenaline rushes, those things affect your brain. We're not gonna do that kind of a test. Our tests are based on the actual questionnaires that are used uh, by the American Medical Association. There's a Korean uh, occupational stress survey and all of these things are interchangeable. And some of the other things that come out of this test are treatment of insomnia. Um, there's also biofeedback. Um, biofeedback is a, another area which is called alternate therapy or adjunctive therapy because right now for the Navy and most therapy, it's, it's talking or medication. And so they're always looking for better uh, avenues. And so with everything that I've found out there looking um, around after uh, reading Una's paper, I think I can actually put together a program. And I would recommend that this program is done with uh, uh, medical professors from the United States working with the groups that are already working on this in Korea. So you could have a better international um, proof of concept and actually use those uh, uh, results in the database uh, to expand the therapy. Because, you know, with WaveGarden providing the kind of uh, technology that they have, wave parks are going to start um, becoming more popular. And the more we can take the advantages that Una's pointed to and do the proof of concept, um, the better it is for everybody. And so I think that actually, you know, wave park physical therapy will become uh, uh, a definite part of treatment. You know, people call it mental illness. Like these kids, if you look at the presentation that uh, Una can post later. Um, these kids didn't have a choice, you know, the kids we worked with, you know, but, but the rewards that they got, uh, especially kids with autism, you know, it, it, they're challenged kids, you know, they're, they're not sick, you know, they just, they, you know, I tell you, you know, after working with some of these kids, I'd break down, you know, cause it just wasn't fair what happened to them. But what we did for those kids and what the wave park can do and what everybody else that's involved in the wave park industry can do is bring a lot of smiles and, and actions in people's lives that they never thought they could have. And so uh, um, that's kind of, you know, where I'm at with, with uh, you know, I, I put on a, an event in 1999 and it was with, uh, I think it was called a Schluterbahn. It was the stationary wave park or wave machine. Where, and, and we did a, a, a surf contest with Swatch. And then in 2001, I did a wave park tour for Seagram's for Margaritaville Tequila. And we went to a wave park at Lion Country Safari then we went to one in Astro World in Houston. And then we went to one, I think it was called Water World in Denver, which was a Six Flags. But to look at the technology that Daywan has um, developed with Wave Garden and Shihung is amazing to me. And I, I really think that um, to be able to, for the Wave part to give back to help people with PTSD and these challenge kids is, is another really big bonus. But, um, you know, so if anybody has any questions or if I confused anybody, um, please let me know. But that's where I, I'm, I'm basically trying to prove Una Kim's uh, concept that she wrote with her paper. Okay, thank you, Mr. Philip. So as he has, Yes, as he has mentioned, 
Yes, if you are interested about the surf therapy program and uh, also the my paper, which was published in the first book of our ITAP journals, you can go in and download to from our website. And as he has mentioned, Ray Park is developing uh, without advice from Mr. Philip to develop surf therapy program for the firefighters with who are likely to have the higher rate of PTSD. So uh, hopefully if we can, we can expand this program to kids with autism and cancer. And now we may proceed to the first session of the conference for the surf park industry. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Brian Dickerson, editor of Wave Pool Magazine. Brian is the chief editor of Wave Pool Magazine that explores the expanding universe of Wave Pool in the world. He is a communication specialist with a fastidious eye for the detail and deep skills for storytelling across any, or any and all digital platforms. Please welcome Mr. Brian. Thank you, Una. Um, it's, it's great to be invited here and it's great to hear uh, Philip's story and how, how wave pools are helping reach communities that uh, traditionally are um, hard, to, hard to reach and, and really help people. There are a lot of ocean-based programs, uh, surfers healing um, for, for autism and such, and they always contend with the ocean. Um, and, and it's great to hear you utilize Wave Park and uh, to get on that and um, make something happen in, in a controlled environment where you can better direct uh, the energy of surfing into, into helping people with PTSD or autism or kids with cancer. Uh, so thank you for that, Philip. Uh, Una, how much time do, uh, do I have? Uh, 15 minutes, Brian. 15 minutes, okay, great. Yes. Uh, I have about a, a seven minute video, which I'll show in the, in the beginning. Uh, basically it's um, that with wave pools right now, uh, a lot of people in the general public don't understand there are two components to it. Like at Wave Park, you are a uh, surf park, which is Wave Park. And then there's the technology for the wave itself, which is by Wave Garden. There are several different technologies on the market uh, at this point, roughly 20, and they all work through varying uh, systems, whether it's pneumatic or foil or a lever-based system like uh, WaveGarden does. So it's uh, just wanted to clear that up first and uh, let, let everyone know there is a distinction between the two. And sometimes that's uh, glossed over. A brief history of wave pools, uh, like Mr. Cuddy was talking about the, uh, the wave parks back in the day. They're um, the first one, interestingly enough, well through the eighties, most wave pools were for people just to go swimming and bounce around. The first one in Arizona was dedicated towards surfing and it lasted that way for a couple of years until they realized the larger market at that time in the United States was uh, people swimming rather than just a surf dedicated component. Um, and then after that, we had Typhoon Lagoon and uh, some, some other places. Uh, Ocean Dome in Japan was amazing. And uh, then in the around Y2K, uh, Wave Garden started up in the Basque country of Spain. And uh, Fernando and Karen came up with their design and their system, starting with a foil. They tried a ring system, which was uh, pretty interesting, but they were just super dedicated and came up with the design that is dominant in the surf park space at this time, which is the Wave Garden Cove. And for very uh, many reasons, people deploy it. It's uh, consistent. It um, offers a lot of waves, a lot of throughput and it's, um, it's, it's very popular. Okay, and the, the reason wave pools are becoming so popular right now, there's uh, a big shift in, in what people like to do, uh, going from kind of a passive experience where you're watching something happen to an active experience. Um, maybe it's kind of the Instagram selfie 
uh, movement at the time, but everyone wants to experience something and to share it. And surfing is, uh, sur surfing is probably up at the top of the, the list, bucket list of things for people to do. And uh, wave pool and controlled environment very much allows that to happen for a lot of people who would not have access to the ocean or would not have access to uh, the right day to, to learn how to surf. Um, the, the great thing about, um, let's see, I'm, I'm gonna go into the technology aspect of it, which is kind of a nerd alert. This is, might get a little geeky, but it's, it, it's really fun stuff to, to dive into. And that would be the um, different main ways to make waves. We have a foil system like you see at the Kelly Slater wave pool. Uh, or the uh, Adventure Park Snowdonia, which is just a plow pulled down a track that uh, pushes out water and creates a wave. There's another one, um, the pneumatic system, which would be like uh, Surf Lock by Tom Lochtefeld, uh, Endless Surf by Whitewater out in Canada, and American Wave Machines with their perfect swell. And that uses air to uh, push water into caissons, and then that water is released in sequence. So you can get very creative in the type of wave that you create, uh, wedges, peaks, and other, other uh, kind of custom menu styled waves. And we saw that in Palm Springs. And in the video, we'll give a little, little demonstration of that. Um, the other kind would be uh, the, the lever system like uh, with wave garden where you have where you displace water with something. Um, wave garden is, is just amazing and that uh, they're very energy efficient. They will have their lever contained within a module. It swings one way, pushes water. It uses the inertia that to come back the other way. So it's not using more energy as it swings back and pushes out a wave on the other side. If you notice, um, next time you're you're at your cove and you're you're watching the waves come through there's a couple seconds between when a left appears and when a right appears um, it's 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 neat stuff and then the uh last one would be the the plunger which um is kind of the the, the great big exciting uh surf lakes model in australia and it's that giant mad max plunger that just, um, it's, it's so awe-inspiring. You look at it, it's this big giant rusting hulk of metal that pushes out a wave in 300 degrees. And we all kind of understand that viscerally because we've all thrown a, a stone in a pond and we've all um, watched waves radiate out and think, oh wow, I could do that. So these guys in Australia did that on the big scale. So I'll, I'll start the video, bear with me as I put this out. I hope my internet connection is good today as we um, are able to, to show this video. And so I will go to share screen. And Una, you might have to help me through here. Okay, uh, you are allowed to share a screen. Can you find it? Yes. Okay. And so I'm going to go share. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. And here's the video. Kelly Slater Wave Company. This is a basic foil design where a foil is pulled down a track at incredible speeds to push out a wave on the left or the right. In this case, it's uh, bi-directional. It goes one way to make a left and the other way to make a right. Uh, other systems push out a wave from both sides, but it's a basic foil setup. The Kelly Slater Wave Company uh, believes strongly in this design. It's, it will be the main attraction at the Coral Springs development in Palm Springs, Palm Desert coming up uh, this uh, later in this year. And while it produces an incredible wave, it uh, does have its, its limits in terms of waves per hour. There's not a lot of waves generated, just one super long, super quality wave. And it, uh, it works for the WSL. It works for exclusive members to, to clubs like Coral Springs. But for your 
average proletariat surfer punching the clock. It's not going to work as well because it is more expensive. Is this coming through okay, Una? Yes, Endless yes. Surf. It... Endless Surf is a part of Whitewater West Industries, which is based out of Canada. And they've made slides and other water park attractions for years and years, 40 years, I believe. And now they've uh, gone into the surf specific wave pool market. And this is really exciting because they have a lot of know-how in terms of engineering, in terms of construction, and development so they know how to get a project done. Their technology is uh, pneumatics based, so they're going to have caissons that push air uh, to push out waves, and the waves will run along their unique heart-shaped pool, which uh, is great. It maximizes uh, coastline uh, in the pool, and it can accommodate quite a few surfers. And we should be seeing something very soon. Tom Lochtefeld, inventor of the Flowrider, uses uh, pneumatics in his surf lock wave pool system. And what happens is there are caissons and air pushes water to fill these caissons. The water is released in sequence to create a wide variety of waves. Now the system is very popular in terms of uh, wave creativity. You can create all types of different waves as evidenced by the Palm Springs Surf Club debut in 2020, where we got to see Tom's technology. And the strength in this system is, again, the, the creativity in producing a variety of waves. You can uh, make the pool to various specs, larger or smaller. At Palm Springs, they have a, the demo pool we saw was an eight caisson pool, and they're currently constructing a 16 caisson pool which will produce uh, larger waves and a longer ride. Wave Garden Cove is first to market and the longest in the game. Uh, they've been at it since 2005 and originally came up with a few different designs, circular plow system, as we'll see in a minute. Um, but their most popular is the Cove. Currently today, it's uh, installed at five spots around the world. And Hosema and Karen, who came up with the design, uh, worked in skate parks for a long time and in athletics and sports management. So they really saw the potential of the, the future wave pool market. And crucial and essential to a successful model is waves per hour, variety of waves and being able to fit a lot of paying clients uh, into the pool at the same time. The Cove has been successful on all those measures. It's a unique system in that uh, but a kind of secret lever uh, system which uh, they won't disclose but maybe at Wave Park you uh, have been privy to <laughs> see what's behind the engineering room. Wave Garden's Lagoon System uh, was the first technology that really opened people's eyes to what's possible in this uh, new generation of wave pools. It's a plow system. It runs down a central pier and produces a left and a right at the same time. Uh, the strengths in this type of tech are that you get a very long ride as long as the foil will travel. And it was the first to really start the whole wave park movement. Uh, we saw Adventure Park Snowdonia deploy one. We saw Inland in Austin, Texas, and it really kind of kicked off this whole uh, wave pool momentum that we're seeing right now. Surf Lakes, the giant plunger in the outback of Australia that has captured the world's imagination. We've seen it produced uh, on many news programs in mainstream media. There's something wonderful about this system. It is very complicated yet simple at the same time. The premise is simply like dropping a stone into a pond. Waves radiate, radiate out 360 degrees and uh, break along different 
shorelines and bathymetry. Besides the, the visual impact of surf lakes, uh, the fact that you have a large surface area for a beachfront and that you can fit a lot of surfers into the wave pool uh, make it very appealing. And we should see one, the one in Yapoon, go commercial. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how their business model develops. Perfect Swell is from American Wave Machines, and that's by Bruce McFarland. And this is a pneumatic system with uh, caissons that fill with air and then push out waves in sequence. Currently, there's American Wave Machines Perfect Swell about to open in Japan. And there's, of course, the one in uh, Waco, Texas, which uh, took the world by storm. Uh, everyone loves that system. They're, they're booked up months in advance. There's a core group of surfers, you know, hours from the beach who, who book up regularly and buy season passes. Um, the great thing about American Wave Machines Perfect Swell is that it's one of the leaders in terms of creativity in producing a wide variety of waves. So through events like Stab High and some special video uh, productions where they create a certain wave for a team rider or an event, um, it's really, really uh, flexible. And that's a big strength of, the, of this system. Okay. Um, yes. Thank, thank you. Uh, so we'll um, oh, stop screen share. Sorry, as okay. I, excuse me while I bumbled through the uh, technology part. Okay. <laughs> so, so we're back. So that's a, a brief explanation of the technologies that are uh, going into the uh, the wave wave park space here. But additionally, there are um, companies, uh, the the Zing Thing uh, Extreme Center in China. They just built a plow system. Uh, South America has two technologies going: Olas and uh, WaveSeg. Um, as well as some others that are waiting to hear, uh, waiting to get their funding to create waves, wave prisms, which is uh, similar to wave garden. And then also there's um, Weber wave pools from the, the very fertile mind of, of Greg Weber. Um, so, and, and that should be really interesting uh, when, when, he, when he has that come out. Um, the, in, in making a successful model, for a wave pool, you you need to have a lot of waves come through. So as, as Una knows, so that you a lot of surfers can be in the pool at the same time. And uh, at, at first, when the plow systems came out, no one really realized this. It was just like, let's make a wave. Let's make a really good wave. Uh, and now number of waves per hour is, is a main contributor. And mm -hmm. as Una is finding out at Wave Park, you businesses tend to sell the, the professional model. I guess it's like a car dealership. You put the sports car in the, in the front yes. window, but everyone ends up buying the uh, sport utility vehicle that's, <laughs> that's in the back. So you need the, the sexy, attractive wave um, to, to get people excited about going there. But then your throughput, your, your basic person learning to surf or intermediate surfer is not gonna use uh, the beast setting or the, the barrel setting like you have. So um, th thank you everyone for, for, for being here and listening. Thank you, Brian, for your interesting presentation. Uh, and thank you for clarifying the brand name of Wave Park, because Wave Park is actually the brand name of our surf park and also the surf pool. And Wave Park also has opened the recreational pools, like diving pools and family for kids pools. So it's all kind of water park creations. And as we all know that surf park or wave pool is now definitely a trend, trending water park systems in, in the world. And that's why we can give people who doesn't have any 
who didn't have any access to the ocean, we can give them opportunity to surf or enjoy the waves. And now we are moving to the next presentation from Surf Park Magazine CEO, Mr. Skip and Ms. Kate. But because of their time differences, uh, they have shared the pre-recorded video. So I will share with you the video. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Skip Taylor of Surf Park Management. I am Kate Thera, also of Surf Park Management, and we're very pleased to be here today to make this presentation on man-made surf parks and the road to success for the International Theme and Amusement Parks Conference and for the Wave Park. Hi, as we get going with today's uh, uh, presentation, I'd like to introduce ourselves and give a little bit of background. We formed Surf Park Management in 2017. It's been very active for years, working with some exciting projects, some we can talk about, some that are uh, uh, private still in development stages, but uh, two primary ones that are in, ones in construction right now in Eva Beach in Oahu is called the lineup at Waikai. Uh, plus we are in some exciting stages with the Cactus Surf Park project in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I personally have traveled to almost every surf park around the world uh, over the last seven, eight years, working with, uh, we're technology agnostic, working with all the different wave technology manufacturers. And we're out here supporting developers uh, and uh, owners of surf parks in trying to guide them to the path to success, along with Kate, my partner. I am Kate there, also co-founder with Skip of Surf Park Management. Um, we've been working on this from all the different stages, from feasibility studies to working on ongoing operations. And uh, we really bring a team of uh, experts really deep from the ski resort, uh, beach, food and beverage, hospitality and spa to work with us on all aspects that we can now bring to this emerging surf park industry. We show we really are very innovative with our strategies, focus on the experience and customers, results oriented, oriented what gets measured, gets managed, gets measured. And we're also very tech forward. We love to take advantage of all the new technologies so that we can leverage and increase the guest experience and operational efficiency. Skip, why don't we take it to you? Sure. Um, one of the first questions people ask as they look into the space of what type of uh, attractions are going to be built, why a surf park? Um, I'll just run through some of the key points. Modern technology now provides quality waves and a profitable business model. It really has evolved. Even though surf park's been around for over 20 years, um, it's really only in the last three to four years that the technology <coughs> has advanced to the point of having a viable uh, technology. Um, there's a growing and committed market. The initial surf parks are showing some great returns of people visiting and coming back over and over. Um, the appeal of reliable, convenient and uncrowded waves. Um, surfing in the ocean these days is getting more and more crowded and creating a tougher, um, less uh, inclusive feeling um, and surf parks neutralizes that completely. Um, they are also a great traffic generating for anchor attractions to different types of development models, whether it be commercial or resort or residential, um, some great opportunities. Speaking on those models within the real estate model of selling real estate, every time you build a surf park, they're finding great enhancements to the real estate values that are around these surf parks. It's also positive and consistent economic impact to the tourism regions that these are launched in. It's been shown to be very strong, positive responses. Um, obviously surfing is a cool and popular sport. Um, and the key to that, it is a sport. It's a legitimate sport. This isn't a water park. It isn't just a fun novelty attraction that somebody comes once a year. This is something people come to do as part of their passion. We'll do multiple times a week, or if they can afford, uh, have the convenience of having it in their own backyard, or they'll travel to it multiple times a year if it's nearby. Um, surf parks are also becoming very popular with surfers up to the very highest levels with it being an Olympic sport right now. You're seeing teams and people coming to train at these facilities as an excellent place to have reliable, redundant, consistent waves. Um, it's also, we say limited water resources required because a lot of people are looking at this and compare it to golf or other attractions and water parks. A, 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 what, a surf park right now only requires the equivalent of one and a half holes of water to a golf course um, of what a surf park operates on. So it is actually very good. 
And it's a great time to be in the industry. It's an early mover positioning posi uh, point right now in the industry. And surf parks are a great addition into the mix of uh, amusement uh, and development opportunities. Um, the relative size of the surf market right now, surf participation, it's big around the world right now. You'll see there's a dot missing in Korea and uh, hopefully with our friends at Wave Park at Turtle Island, we're gonna see a dot growing very quickly over the Korea area, but there is a big global participation worldwide right now. And we're seeing with the travel and destination market, it's been a big part of adding surf parks into the mix. To understand the evolution of surf parks right now, it has started, um, you know, really the new era of surf parks in 2015 with the Surf Snowdonia. And then just a little bit after that with Kelly Slater coming out with their technology um, and both kind of on what we call a sled or a, a, a wake that's drawn with a, a cable through the water with a, a, a large plow that creates the wave. Then what was an exciting, uh, um, what was advancement by WaveGarden, the group you're working with, they launched um, the WaveGarden Cove technology in Bristol and then Melbourne, and then went on to Turtle Island. And the WaveGarden Cove has been an ex incredibly um, exciting advancement in the surf park technology and showing great results. As we evolve on, there's some future projects coming online right now. Um, in the deep in the planning stages with the Kelly Slater Wave Co at Coral Mountain in the Palm Desert area. Also in the Palm Desert area, another Wave Garden Cove coming online with uh, Desert Surf. Uh, and then the project we mentioned before at Eva Beach that Kate and I are helping oversee. Uh, this is the world's largest standing wave that's going to be developed uh, as well as part of a major attraction on Oahu. The evolution then takes another step beyond the uh, smaller land parcels to much bigger envision projects. And I think Wave Park Turtle Island is probably the most significant step in the uh, model of surf parks right now, where it includes a much broader vision of hospitality and hotels and theme parks and entertainment. So it's quite fantastic to see. Another great one we see coming online is with the Endless Surf Group and uh, in uh, France right now. Um, their plans, what they're doing in Paris, that's going to be launched in time for the upcoming Olympics in Paris. All over to Kate right now. Thanks, Skip. So we talk about the emergence of surf parks, but let's also talk about what it takes for the road to success for people who are interested in getting into the surf park industry. And we really do call it to the road to success with really essentially five different stages. Let's start with the first one, the Envision Amplified Returns. So what we talk about this is, is a surf park but it has to be more than just the surfing. It has to have all the different components to it to really create a diversified revenue stream to increase the dwell time that people will be there and also to appeal to the different niche markets for, for a whole family. So if someone isn't surfing that they could go doing dry land activities or shopping or other special programming and events that keep it fresh and then make it so that even the local folks wanna come back over and over again. So that's sort of our amplified return. Skip, why don't we take it to the next step on the road? Sure. The next step on the road to success is operationally optimized design. What we mean by this is really engaging with an operational outlook when you go into your design. There's lots of great renderings and, and design plans we've seen. A lot of times there's a lack of oversight uh, to the operational components. Um, we really start with the customer journey first and making sure that it's a seamless experience from, from uh, pre-booking, pre entry to the park, right till their experience of surfing and as they depart. Um, and that land and building plan design is, is essential to flow correctly. And then there's the uh, FF&E and os &E plan and making sure that you're having all the um, setup and plans to work properly, including uh, systems that work from kitchen design to back of house office space and making sure you've accommodated for all the operational elements you need to consider. And then the last is system integration. We work very technology forward and data, power, locations all throughout your, your surf venue and your ancillary revenue areas is key to consider and how you're controlling the flow of customers and how you're monitoring to them. A lot of that is, is uh, has to be done very early on in the design stages and not something that can be added at the last minute. Next up to Kate. Sure, the next step is really what it all comes down is we call it the customer centric marketing and we we're on the customer centric marketing it's really about getting 
looking at who can come when, seeking what experience at what price. And that's really the work of customer segmentation and understanding the different markets and how you can attract them. And then also looking at your sales funnel. How do you bring them from becoming aware to actually showing up and booking and then becoming loyal advocates for their surf park? And again, to, in order to do that, bring them through the nurturing process, it's a multi-channel a process. So it's not just our independent travelers. We really need to rely on the group business because the pre-book business is a key element for us to what we call weatherproof. In case there's any bad days, you can have some groups booked, working with your travel partners, programming, uh, some of the different uh, activities, and also making sure that you're working with your travel partners, travel agencies, and uh, wholesalers, as well as the corporate groups. Multi-channel, work through your sales conversion funnel, and segment your customers seems to be our keys. Skip, back to you. Great. Uh, let's talk about balancing the three-legged stool. Um, we have three partners that we always consider at every uh, opportunity we work with in the surf park world. One is the financial partners and the investors and ensuring that they are getting the data and the reporting the information that's needed to not only what's happening that day, the past month, but forward looking is more important. What are your bookings? What are your outlook? Where are you going? So you can make those adjustments to react and be proactive in, in steering the ship uh, of uh, the operations of the surf park. The second key to success to the pillar is the customers. Um, and obviously, they have to have a seamless experience from start to finish, and they also have to have an experience that's going to inspire them to come back and be repeat customers. We want them to have extended dwell time so they stay longer, they spend more, they have a better time, and they're more likely to come back over and over. Then the last uh, uh, leg to the stool is the employees. Often overlooked is the employee culture and creating an environment where you're the preferred employer of that region. Oftentimes, these surf parks are built in regions where there's lots of hospitality and entertainment activities around, and you need to stand out and create a culture for your employees uh, that allows them to want to stay and be long-term and loyal to you. And you have one great advantage in the surf park world, and that is most people really want to enjoy riding the waves themselves. So setting yourself up to give surf time and activities for your employees early in the morning, late in the evenings, or uh, between shifts, if you can include them in some of the participation side, it's very similar to the ski industry as well. It's a great payback and a bonus for employees. Over to Kate. So the, the last stage on our road to success is really professional management. And the requirements of this professional management is you've, well, you need to have managers who are adept, not only at managing the surf side of it, but really it's the full experience from food and beverage, the retail and rental, sales and marketing, getting people in the door, programming, making the activity fresh, working with partners, leveraging brands, and of course, managing the general administration, the accounting, the human resources, all of the elements of that facilities maintenance. And so where we look at it, we've got the three stages of engagement. And Skip, why don't you start us off with the first one? Sure. We, we typically recommend these are the stages and phases as you go into the mode of developing a surf park. One is the technical services side, and that involves initial concept and viability review and feasibilities uh, analysis to make sure that you do have a chance of success from the start. And the uphill battle isn't in place that you've picked the right sites, you've got the right technology, those type of things. Then you go on to the concept plan, uh, including operational planning, land planning, FF&E planning, and then into the operational plans. And you, these are business plans, sales and marketing plans, critical path over the year to two years of building your park and facility and bringing in all your uh, onboarding, your technical and software and configurations. And then the next stage really is pre-opening. And we look at this stage as probably the six to nine months leading up to opening when you're really putting everything in place, you're starting to hire the on-site employees, um, finalizing your line item budgets, negotiating with individual vendors, whether it be food and beverage vendors or retail vendors, buying your equipment, executing the sales and marketing plan, getting the PR out, getting your building your database of potential customers, contacting your groups, uh, meeting planners and, and travel partners, and then also building all of the finalizing the structure so that you're moving the staff in, you're setting up the furniture and fixture, getting all of your on-site operating supplies and equipment, a final installation of the technology, the POS, you can do your online bookings, 
the surf technology is working, everything's been commissioned, the licenses are done. And then you start on your soft opening to make sure that the staff is fully trained and they've gone through all the safety and risk management so that when you do finally go to that grand opening that everything is running on all four cylinders and it's just a phenomenal experience for guests, employees and the investors. And Skip, why don't we take us to the third Your management team is responsible for reporting uh, to ownership. Um, and that's a very key stage we talked about earlier on. Then our operations management. There's a long list of things to talk about here, but we are overseeing all the functional areas of a venue, ensuring that they're all humming along and synchronizing um, and hitting their targets, and their goals, and creating their response, their return on investment that ownership is expecting there. Uh, the final stage is ongoing financial planning and analysis. As Kate was saying early on, what gets measured gets managed. We're very robust and any management company should be on measuring all analytics of operation from technical side of power consumption to your, your staff uh, uh, ratio and, um, and optimizing uh, your, your management of staff um, down to um, uh, uh, water consumption and all your so many areas of the analysis and planning that we comes into play here. And there's many tools that you can bring to life to, to do that. So that wraps up today's presentation. And if you wanna keep in touch with us, you can look us up at Surf Park Management. And uh, it's been a fantastic chance to get to uh, showcase the Surf Park world to the ITAP world. And I'll, I'll let Kate sign off for a final thank you. Yeah, it was a pleasure. And I am uh, look forward to visiting uh, Wave Park at Turtle Island and wish you all the best of luck there. Thank you. Okay, thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Skip and Kate. Uh, we should have him joining us today, but because of the time difference, we could only watch their videos. But if you have any questions, you can ask, send us the question to, uh, to our email, we'll deliver it to them. And they're talking about why a surf park or, and also the each stage of the managing and operation was very interesting. And also we have uh, managers from Urban Surf. Uh, James is here joining us. So we all might be very interested about this successful way of making this surf park. And, and they also mentioned that not only uh, about their facilities or technologies are important, but we also have to take care of these customer experiences. So we have to view the surf park experiences from the customer's perspectives. Our next presenter, uh, Ms. Sujang Kim from Busan National University. She will be presenting us the perceived value of surfers on man-made surf parks and how the values effects on loyalty of, of customers. So please welcome Ms. Sujang Kim. Uh, thank you, Anna. Let me share my presentation first. All right, um, as Una briefly mentioned, I will focus on software's like a, or visitor's perspective rather than the, the technology or uh, those sort of things. Uh, and also my presentation will more about academic perspectives rather than the industrial perspectives. So please think about that one. Um, my presentation will focus on the software's perceived value and how, uh, how those things will really impact on satisfaction and loyalty of artificial wave pools. And also I, uh, it's about the explore the how difference will be perceived from the beginners and advanced surfers. Uh, as already the present, as already the previous presenters, presenters mentioned, surfing is one of the fattest growing sports. It's around 23 million or surfing population around the world. And as the pre before the previous presentation mentioned, uh, it's mainly from the North America and Australia. And Asia is about the growing uh, market. And also, 
the, there is the increasing surfing market. It's about 3.1 billion in revenue from the hardware, such as softboard and also wetsuits or footwear by 2026. And we already know that surfing is the sport of riding a wave toward the shore with using softboard. And surfers is also mentioned as a nomad of seeking uh, perfect waves, which means waves is the uh, very important for surfing. However, because of the weather or because of the temperature and because of the all the reasons, it is not easy to get the perfect wave and the eager chase for the perfect waves result the development of artificial pools. And as we already know, Wave Garden is the leading company of artificial pools. And this is the, the mess where the Wave Gardens has, has, done, has uh, developed and been de developing the artificial pools around the world. And there's several in North America and in European countries. And we have of, uh, two in Australia here, and we can see one in Sihin, Korea here as well. So this map shows how the artificial wave pools has been developed and is the uh, expanding industry in the world. Well, artificial pools actually broaden the surfing, mar surfing market itself as well, because artificial pools allow young and older people to connect the place of working on water. Uh, as the Pili mentioned before, because of the temperature or because of the, the highest, highest of the waves, because of those sort of things, uh, young and older people has fear of trying to surf in the na nature, in the ocean. But artificial wave pools is under human control. We, uh, artificial wave pools is controlled, uh, its temperature is controlled and its waves is controlled as well. So young and older people have more, has less fear of trying surfing on the artificial wave pools. And also the people in the unusual and, and landlocked areas can try surfing. Uh, uh, Korea, Australia, or America, we all have the oceans by nations, but some areas which doesn't have ocean can try, can experience surfing with the artificial wave pools. Well, this artificial wave pools is expanding and growing industry, but there's little research in tourism industry about the artificial wave pools. Well, there's very little interest, there there's very little research of uh, surf tourism in tourism research, but no, uh, the artificial wave pools has been less interested. So my research, we explore the surfers' experiences in man-made wave pools. The three specific objectives are to, ident to identify service quality attributes of man-made wave pools. For example, what kind of factors, for example, the quality, the quality of the waves or the quality of the food court or the accessibility and what service quality attributes will impact or it will be there in artificial wave of pools. And the second objective is to explore the relationships between the quality attributes, the perceived value, satisfaction, and loyalty. For example, uh, what, how the, uh, the quality of the waves will impact on perceived value or will impact on satisfaction and real impact on the intention to recommend, recommend it to others, those sort of thing. And the third objective is to investigate the moderating law of the surface level. Uh, as we can see the wave park here, in the artificial wave pools, there are different levels of surfers. Somebody will be the first trier and somebody will be very, will be very advanced level of surfers. So they will have different perceptions for the same quality attributes. So I will explore those sort of things as well. And this is my research conceptual framework. So for my first objective again is to identify the quality of quality attributes of artificial wave pools. 
and what kind of attributes there are. And I the second objective is to explore how these quality attributes will impact on satisfaction and perceived value and loyalty. And also for the third objective, I will uh, explore the differences on those relationships between the beginners and advanced level of surfers. My research method, my research will have two stages, <laughs> will be conducted in, at two stages. At the first stage, uh, I, will conduct, I will conduct a semi-structured interviews with the representatives at the Wave Park in Korea, in Sihun. And then I will attract and identify uh, service quality attributes of artificial wave, wave pools through thematic and content analysis. At the second analysis, <clears throat> um, a quantitative online surveys will be conducted to the actual visitors who visited before the uh, web park in Sihun. And then the collective data will be analyzed through the confirmatory factor analysis to explore, uh, to check the quality attributes will be um, uh, it's a reliability and the collective data is also will be is will be analyzed through SCM to explore the relationships which I mentioned before the relationships between the quality attributes and the perceived value satisfaction and loyalty and the modulating role of the surface level well the Result. This is the working paper, so I haven't collected the, the, the data yet. But the result will expand the surfing tourism literature literature by providing the quality attributes. And the quality attributes, which will be found through this research, will be the foundation for the future research of artificial wave pools. And this quantitative data, the previous studies mostly explored the surface uh, perceptions based and most research used qualitative research is more about the interview method. But I will conduct quantitative data, I will conduct uh, question, uh, a question, questionnaire surveys. So the quantitative data will provide a more rigorous research and will enhance the reliability of the research area. And from practical perspectives, <clears throat> the research will, uh, the marketers can use the results and can make a different strategies to the different levels of surfers. For example, for the uh, beginner surfers, they might be inf more influenced by the quality of uh, Food court or the quality of infrastructure, and may, while the advanced surfers may be more influenced by the quality of waves, so marketing marketers can use the result and can make different strategies based on the level of the surfers. And also, I hope my research will enhance the popularity of the surfing in Korea, and. And this will enhance the leisure industry at all as well. And this is my presentation. And this beautiful photo is from the Wave Park, which is our important sponsors. Thank you for my, listening to my presentation. And if you have any questions, welcome any questions and comments to my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Suzong, for your interesting uh, research. And we hope we can, uh, Wave Park can help you to collect the qualitative or quantitative data from the customer's perspective. And for the question, uh, this is the end of the, our first session of the Surf Park. For the questions and discussion panels, we'll continue after we finish our second session of tourism. So uh, we, have, we have our panel discussions. So please wait until the end of the discussion for the second session. And because we have a lot of Koreans joining us, 
may I just uh, may I speak for a while in Korea to <laughs> for their attention? Uh, 지금 저희 첫 번째 세션은 서핑 파크로 이제 끝났고요. 두 번째 세션 관광을 시작하기 전에 한 10분간 어, 휴식을 하고 진행을 하려고 하는데요. 어, 지금 참가자 분들이 많이 빠지고 있는 것 같아서 저희 웨이브 파크 후원사에서 참가 어, 학회 마지막에 추첨을 통한 그 서핑 이용권을 준비해놨거든요. 그래서 자리에 계속 참석을 해주시면 추첨까지 하도록 하겠습니다. So we shall start our second session of tourism. So we have our first presenter of Ms. Uh, Professor Lozier Lawyer. Uh, he's a, he served as a Secretary General of the Spanish Chamber of Commerce in Korea and is currently doing a PhD program in IT management at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, please welcome Mr. Lozier Lawyer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me share the screen. I will try to be brief because actually the most of the times I'm teaching and then, you know, sometimes uh, the time just goes very okay. fast. Okay. Did you see? Yes, we can see this. Right now, right? Slide. Okay. Yes. Great. Um, so thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for this very interesting presentation. So I, will, I would like to talk about tourism in Spain and Korea. I think both countries have a lot of things in common and that's why this is something I would like to highlight. But before, as you already introduced me, it's, I'm going to be brief here as well. Um, I'm a PhD researcher at KAIST. KAIST is one of the most important, or actually the most important in terms of technology university here in Korea. So actually, uh, this is Kim gave me a lot of gave me a lot of ideas for for a future research. I can also work together. Also, I worked for the with the Spanish Chamber of Commerce uh, in Korea for four years. Indeed, we launched the chamber from scratch until uh, I was until last year when I decided to come to the academic field and as advisor for the Daejeon city government. So this is the city where I am. Daejeon is located in the center of South Korea. We don't have sea. So we will have to move from one, I mean, to one side to the other. Mm. I really miss the, the sea. I'm, I'm actually from Barcelona. So you, you may uh, realize that it's, the sea is very important for me. So I just wanted to add this picture because I was in some way involved. I mean, I, I gave all of my best for for this project to become true. And indeed, at that time, it was November 2018, we were thinking, here we are with the ambassador, with the consular, actually, Mrs. Zuna is already, is also here. And in that time, we were thinking, wow, this is crazy. I mean, how can they finish a wave park in two years? How can they, these big projects that are sometimes difficult to imagine? And I don't know, now it's, we happened two years already and, and the dream comes true, right? So that's why I'm very happy to be part since the beginning and, and being that everything has been that well organized and done. So I just wanted to highlight that. And um, for the countries, uh, you know where is Spain, you know where is Korea. I just wanted to introduce a couple of things. Um, in terms of population, GDP, I um, mean, Korea is now going farther and faster than, than Spain. We, but we are in terms of GDP in position 14, 10. In terms of population, 47, 52. So it's, it's kind of quite similar countries. And that's why it's, uh, it's very interested, interesting. And when we come to tourism, um, Spain is the third country most visited in the world, just after uh, the States and France. And this is something that it needs an improvement. Korea is the 20th. It means there is a lot of room for improvement here. They, I think Korea has put a lot of effort. If you come to Korea and, or you are in Korea, you already know that there are amazing places to visit. And I think the wave, uh, wave park is one of a good examples that will. In terms of travel and tourism competitiveness index, Spain, luckily in, uh, in the first position, Korea, we have uh, way to go, 
but I think this would be a very good contribution. I I'm not sure I had to call to introduce Korea, but everybody knows Korea. I just wanted a few data about Spain, the area. Maybe you already know some cities you've been already here. I would like to highlight three different cities or three different areas. The one in Madrid would be the capital, but since I'm from Barcelona and also Fernando and all the way, uh, Garden team is from the north of Spain. I, I think this is the most important part of Spain and where we have a very multicultural country. Languages, as you know, we have different languages, we have different, Spanish is the other tongue for all of us, but for example, I speak Catalan, uh, Fernando speaks Euskera, so that's a very multicultural country. And things that are very important, I think that the relations between Korea and Spain were for many years, very good in terms of tourism. Uh, since 2000, I mean, from 2011 and 2019, you can see how the numbers have grown. Like we were 75,000 75, people visited Korea at that time, 2011. But in less than seven, eight years, we see the numbers skyrocketing, right? So this is something very, very interesting. It's something absolutely that's been pause right now because of many reasons we know already uh, but again the potential of those of the relation of the tourism and, and especially when you highlight the good and the bad from each country uh, can give you this kind of output where where a lot of visitors and connections start and as you can see then the, the lines look similar but indeed here we're talking about thousands and tens of thousands. And in Spain, people to Korea, I can say Korea has improved a lot. It's um, kind of a way to show the world how where they are, how they are. I think K-pop on the Korean wave, uh, that it's not just for music, but also for film and other different areas has improved a lot. And I think that will be, be how that will we give benefits to many different areas, as sports and uh, languages and culture. So that's why this is something very important. And I, everybody knows how, how why tourism is important. And but I think I, here I would like I would like to highlight to understand why we we come from eleven thousand or or seventeen five fifty thousand seventy five to 629. And I think if you were in Korea, you already know, if you are from another country, you can not imagine the impact of those TV shows. So indeed, I just highlighted a few of them. So those are TV shows where some Koreans, in the first case, like Kotboda, Halbeda, people went to, to Barcelona and start showing the city, start showing places. So suddenly everybody were like kind of, wow, we need to visit that place as well, right? Then, then there was another program, the Chiktang, where they went to Canarias Islands. Another program, the Spain Hasok, where they had a hostel just next to the uh, Camino de Santiago, like Santiago's road, I think it's called. So the, the, the TV shows, the dramas had a very important role in order to improve and, and, as we say, to connect Spain and Korea. And I think this been done, done in one way. I think nowadays we don't see that impact yet because we are not traveling. But now I see even people from Spain just telling me, oh, how Korea it is. I want to go to Korea. I want, I'm eating a McDonald's, BTS nuggets and I want to see how where they where their nuggets come from right so it's a very interesting point here and then the culture has a very relevant uh, role to improve the tourism in both, both countries and just to highlight that also I wanted to say that it's not about tourism I mean tourism is maybe just what we see the uh, iceberg but that, but behind or, or below the sea, 
we see there are many things, many, many different ways where our countries are sharing and our, or we improve the connections. I mean, the culture itself is maybe the first thing you see and you discover. But then you, you connect with the sports, as we see, I mean, I'm from Barcelona, you may know the team I'm supporting, but the surf in the north of Spain, the different, I don't know, the, the Formula One, everything that we have, it's a very good opportunity to connect our countries. As well, I think Korean language and Spanish language are in some way the, the first place to, or the first thing you do if you want to really deeply know a country. And that's why I think this tourism has impact in many different areas and the commerce as well. I think this is the area which are where I was more connected with because it's, since I was in the Spanish Chamber of Commerce, we, we knew from the first moment that since Koreans were visiting Spain later, they were coming here and they were saying, okay, I want to keep tasting those chips, like those olives or whatever it comes. And this is, I think, a good example as well. I want to keep surfing with uh, waves on the north of Spain. So maybe I would find a place here in Korea that I can have the same experience. So I would like to, to highlight, and by the way, the idea of bringing this Spain, or Spain flavor with the Spain guild that you have on the, these projects that you have to connect these two countries is very, very beautiful and very insightful. But then, <laughs> and I think it's, it's sad to say and to talk about that, but it's, we need just, there is a hope, right? I mean, we know this Black Swan event, something that couldn't happen, that we were, that we did not imagine that could happen, just happen, right? And then you can see the lines, right? Uh, everything, how good was it in 2019 at suddenly 2020, February, I was actually coming from Spain to Korea at that time, and then I have never left that from since that moment. So I'm I'm just stuck here waiting for a good moment to return, I mean, uh, to visit at least my family. So this is something that absolutely has impacted our life, but we have a solution in some way. Do we have a, it's, um, maybe people may say that it's not a perfect solution, that maybe the things can change, can evolve, but, as we see, we see news. I think I got those different news from from Yonhap News just a few days ago. How South Korea will allow overseas groups tours of fully vaccinated citizens, or even in Spain, welcomes all vaccinated tourists. It means, I don't know. I'm sure you are already you are sharing that with me. You have the feeling to. I mean, just leave and start a new normal life. I'm indeed vaccinated here in Korea, so I mean, it, still we are a bit slow, but I think uh, the solution is coming and the moment where we are just going to use all the money we have saved during those months and spend it and spend it. And I think we have to be ready and, and have the places to enjoy. And I think that's why the wet, what is next, right? When we have this solution, I think at that point, it would be up to people. That's the most important. And I think I, will, I wanted to highlight this part because it's, if we have the trust, we have the willingness, that's for sure. We really want to, to get out. And then maybe for surfing, it's not that difficult. You, don't, you are not that much surrounded of people. But still, you know, I mean, nobody likes to be. And again, I think many... Um, as I mean, I've been in private organizations, I've been working with public organizations, and I think we have a very important role. I think Wave Garden and the one plus, I just, I just uh, put it here because I think it's in some way we need to give this trust that okay, places are ready, safety, I mean, no, no problem with the we are following all this kind of. Uh, roles that we need just to be aware of. But the idea is once we can start with this new normal thing, the thing will come back to the past. And in some way, 
I, the public organizations have a very important role. I think the embassy, I just highlighted here the, the Instituto Cervantes is one of the, um, it's the public of, uh, organization for the Spanish language, as well as Tourism Spain mm -hmm. or the counterparts in Korea, which have a very important role as well. As maybe the news are already there, but I think uh, the president Mujain would be would go to to Spain and Austria in the following weeks. So I think we hope those relations come back, and then we can just go on back and 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 keep traveling. So as we say. The tourists between Spain and Korea has been in different waves, right? Uh, we've seen the, the wave of the different programs, the dramas, and we've been increasing exponentially since now. So we expect also the wave garden would be the next wave for the relations between Korea and Spain. And I wanted just to stop here. I know we didn't, I did not have a lot of time uh, since we have just 15 minutes to share a lot, but I would like to yeah, here actually in this you have my email and my contact. Indeed, I'm now more in the in the tech side, right? It's, since Kite mm -hmm. is a technology university and also in the management side with uh, with Solbridge Business School. So I'm very open to I mean for all of you if you want to have any question or everything you want to say. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lawyer, for your interesting presentation. And it was great to see the old pictures back to 2018. Mr. Lawyer has helped a lot for the successful launch of the Way Park project because he was working as a secretary general in the mm -hmm. Spanish Chamber of Commerce. And not because of the, we are bringing this Spanish technology to Korea with Wave Garden, but also Spain and Korea has celebrated 70 years of diplomatic relations last year. But because of this pandemic, the Black, Black Swan event, we had to like close down a bit and tourism went down. Mm -hmm. And now we are, I think, recovering from the, uh, with the vaccinations. And here, some of you, like Philip and Richard, they already had the vaccines here from America. And in Korea, we are a bit slow, but let's try to make grow this uh, tourism again. So I think it will, Wave Park will also help a lot. And now we are moving to the last session of the presentation. Uh, uh, this, our our co-chair of the International Theme and Amusement Park Com uh, Society, Mr. Uh, Professor Kwon man -woo. He will present us with the theme park study as individual academic field, interdisciplinary and convergent characters. Please welcome Professor Kwon. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm Manu Gwon from Gyeongsang University in Busan. And maybe everybody you don't know well about our university. Uh, let me introduce me and uh, my university first. Uh, Gyeongsang University is very famous in Busan, but not in Korea, because everybody know Busan International Film Festival. The Gyeongsang University made that film festival uh, 25 years ago. And uh, Gyeongsang University also made the uh, Busan, uh, do you know the advertising, Busan advertising uh, festival? Maybe you don't know. It's, uh, the name is Ed Star, and uh, Gyeongsang made the Ed Star festival also. And we have BCM, Busan Contents Market. This, uh, it was uh, Asia's largest uh, contents market. And uh, that was also uh, Gyeongsang University's masterpiece. So uh, 
Anyway, I came to Gyeongsang University 23 years ago. And before then, I was a journalist in Joseon Daily newspaper. And uh, uh, 23 years ago, I was a professor in mass media department. And uh, three years later, I made graduate school of digital design and I moved to that graduate school. And then I made a uh, school of digital content and I moved again. And, and I made a school of digital media. So now my belonging is school of digital media. So that means I moved four times in Gyeongsang University. So everybody called me convergence guy. So today, uh, my topic is about that kind of convergence phenomena. As you know, the theme park is very convergent and interdisciplinary area because the, for example, the amusement riding machine is a mechanical engineering uh, area, but the, the tourism is a kind of social science. And uh, we need the, the most important factor is now the user experience or user psychology. It's a, also art and humanities area. So uh, the impact study is exactly at the crossroad of many uh, different disciplines. So I will speak today uh, about that kind of convergence phenomena in the impact. Uh, but before then, the, uh, I will tell you about the uh, kind of uh, a policy of uh, each different countries. For example, the United States of America announced uh, converging technology strategy in 2002. The, the, the name is NBIC Quartet. NBIC means Nano Bio Info Cognitive Technology. So the United States government uh, defined these four and big technology is key technologies in the future. So they made the NB quartet policy 21 years ago, and then they renewed that policy uh, 2006 and renew again 2013. So they announced the 10 big ideas which uh, 10 big ideas that uh, change the world. So now uh, the United States government also uh, invest uh, on that 10 big ideas, huge money every year. So motivated by the United States government policy, the EU also uh, made a kind of a convergence strategy. The name is CTEC 2004. So two years later, uh, after the United States made. But uh, and every year, the EU committee, EU government uh, invest about that kind of converging technology, huge money. For example, EU FP7, maybe you, you don't know about the FP, it's a abbreviation of a framework program. It's seven years program. So every seven years, EU government set up uh, a kind of uh, funding program for researchers and for companies. So the EFP7, the budget was 67 billion euro. It's just about uh, converging technology. But uh, now this is the EFP9 period. The, the other name is Horizon 2020, last year started. The, the budget was 95 billion euro. Uh, per every year. So anyway, in contrast to the US government policy, the EU approach is different because the United States government uh, strongly focus on techno or kind of technology focused, but the EU approach is uh, focused on uh, convergence of technology with uh, social and uh, humanities field. For example, the and not just uh, limited to NB, the EU focus on nano bio info coconut plus, social, anthro, philo, geo, echo, urbo, urbo, macro, micro, nano. It's a kind of circulation. It's a different policy. 
So EU is more human-centered policy. And the Japanese government also started uh, 2007. Uh, the name is, uh, you can see the Chinese alphabet, but this is not just Chinese alphabet. It's, you can see also Japanese alphabet. Uh, it's, uh, the meaning is transdisciplinary science and technology academic roadmap. Yeah, it's very wrong name, but anyway, before, uh, after that year, that uh, roadmap, Japanese government uh, deleted the uh, uh, world between uh, uh, humanities and arts and humanities and uh, technology. It's very weird phenomena in Asia, for example. In Korea, uh, when we go to high school, we have to decide curriculum. Yeah. Art and humanities focused curriculum and engineering and natural science focused curriculum. Uh, we, we, we don't have any choice. We have to decide this, okay, art and humanities field or natural science and uh, engineering field. It's uh, our education's uh, problem. Because of the Japanese colonial period, Japanese uh, government made that policy. For 70 years, we maintained that kind of curriculum in high school uh, education system and university also we are saying that we have many different uh, college and department the college system and department system exactly separated into two groups yeah art and humanities and engineering and natural science that was our problem anyway uh, from 2007 Japanese government deleted the world between the two different areas it's very innovative uh, decision. But the Korean government, uh, anyway, the, the, the policy name is, you can see four different alphabet. It's Japanese and Chinese and Korean alphabet. So the pronunciation is Muli Yunga. The first alphabet, Moon means humanities or arts. The second alphabet, Li means natural science or engineering. The, the other two alphabets, Yung Hap, is it means convergence or fusion. So Japanese government decided to delete that kind of wall or block. So it's a Muli Yunga policy. But our government adopted that kind of policy just the last year. Yeah, just the last year, uh, our government decided to abolish that, okay, wall. So Korean government started a uh, convergence technology policy uh, made the kind of roadmap in 2009. Yeah, it's first, uh, it's a five years plan. Uh, this year is a third stage of the, the convergence policy. Anyway, because of this kind of uh, uh, international trend, now we can see many uh, convergence academy uh, or convergence uh, structure or uh, academic structure in university system. For example, uh, yeah, I'm, I moved four times. It's, it's, it, it's impossible. Yeah. Who can, who want to move yeah, here and there? For example, I was a social science department, uh, mass media. And then I made the engineering, uh, this design is an uh, engineering background. And, and then I moved, now current my belonging is art. Yeah, art college. It's a very uh, strange thing, but uh, I enjoyed, yeah, I enjoyed that moving. So uh, I think theme park is similar. Yeah, theme park is mix of everything, technology, real estate, tourism, marketing, even art and design and even sports marketing, a mix of everything. It's a very, very interdisciplinary area. So anyway, interdisciplinary research means uh, a mode of research by teams or individuals that integrate different information, different data, and different knowledge together. As, uh, the, as you see in the screen, it, it is definition of uh, United States National Academy of Science. 
So interdisciplinary means uh, we, we have similar concepts. For example, uh, we have multidisciplinary. The terminology is, as you see in the upper picture, the different academic area like A and B yeah, join together to work on common problem. But after the project end, the A and B split apart ag again and unchanged. Yeah, it means multidisciplinary. But the interdisciplinary means a different academic area A and B or different knowledge A and B meet together to work on common question or problem. And after the project end, they still have interaction and the interaction may make a new research field or discipline. So now I'm thinking about the theme park uh, as an academic field, theme park is a kind of interdisciplinary area. Maybe soon we will see a department of theme park or department major of theme park in Korean education system soon. But now, now, now there, there are no uh, school of digital uh, school of uh, theme park in Korea, maybe in, in other countries also. But I expect soon we will have a department or a school of theme park soon. So here is uh, another example, for example, design. Uh, design is a very multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary uh, academic area. For example, uh, when I came to Gyeongsang University, uh, we have uh, department of visual design and department of industrial design, product design, and even information design. We have fashion design also. We have a craft design. Now uh, there are six design related department in our university system. It, it is a problem because the design is common, but the different anyway department, they need to combine together. But uh, five years ago, uh, they combined together. But after five years later, they separated again. Yeah, why? Because, yeah, it's because human problem. They have different uh, knowledge, but uh, they can they, they can mix and they can communicate. But the problem is, as you know, the professors, the professors are very <laughs> separate and independent characters. Yeah, they don't want to join together. They don't want to communicate together. So anyway, we made one school of this design, but now we separated into six different design uh, department. So uh, anyway, now the world trend is the design field needs combining uh, humanities, engineering, social laws, and cognitive science also. Yeah, but our, our school trend uh, uh, go backward, not go, <laughs> front, okay? So uh, in Korea, I'm worrying about uh, that kind of similar phenomena will happen in theme park academy. Uh, I'm worried about that point. So even in the medical area, so 10 years ago, the medical technology was most important factors, okay? But now in Samsung hospital or uh, Hyundai Hospital in Seoul, they really, really focus on service science because of the user's satisfaction and the user's interaction, user's needs are important, more important than the technology. But the heavy disease, for example, cancer, yeah, cancer needs technology, but every day we, 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 we don't want, we don't go to hospital, yeah. So, Every day we visit uh, clinics near our neighborhood. Uh, they need uh, service science or design uh, more than uh, service the technology. So everywhere the user-centered approach is more important than technology and marketing. So my suggestion is theme park is also have to focus on the user, uh, user experience, because the theme park experience is 
experiences are not tangible and uh, they are not separable from consumption and they cannot be stored and owned and they are very complex experiences so quality the user user satisfaction is kind of quality satisfaction it is very difficult to measure so uh yeah skip this and uh my uh my mission is uh, about uh, focus on uh, not just not focus do not focus on technology itself for example the world trend yeah for example japan and uh, china even korea we have a uh, very super high tech uh, uh, ride machines for example and lotte uh, department store in seoul lotte world you can encounter many uh, interesting machines uh, uh, equipped with uh, VR, virtual reality, and the mobile media. But uh, uh, thinking about the user experience, yeah, that is more important than the writing machines. So nowadays, uh, the world trend is, yeah, every theme parks uh, around the world now evolving to super high tech uh, theme park. Even Wave Park, maybe soon you will meet uh, super high tech machines here and there. But uh, I know uh, the riding machines are core facilities of theme park. For example, Wave Park, the core machine is wave generator. But uh, uh, my suggestion is uh, focus on, if you focus on uh, user psychology uh, and the user experience, the theme park must be the new, uh, 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 differentiate the characteristics. So we are here today, uh, may, many different backgrounds, for example, tourism uh, field and even industry area. Maybe some students are from humanities and uh, my students are from art school. So uh, I think this conference is a starting point to make theme park as a academic study area. Yeah, this is very small beginning point, but I, I expect next year or three years later, we will have uh, more guests and more business side guests and uh, I hope talking together about this kind of user psychology, technology, and uh, we can mix the heterogeneous uh, uh, academic area together. Yeah, I, I, I want to suggest that kind of uh, place. Yeah. This conference will be that kind of place. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kwon, for uh, introducing us about the interdisciplinary research. And I think his, uh, his presentation meets the aim of this conference, which is to bring the practical knowledge and academic insight. And also, as he has mentioned, we hope to see the development and expanding of the theme park division as an academic field. And also, he has mentioned that we have we all are joining from all different fields. And uh, I would like to mention uh, Mr. Rohan Bogani from joining us. He's the CEO of the Storybox. And also we have Sebast Mr. Sebastian Lettinger, CEO of the Inari company. So we are, uh, we are all from different fields, but we can share the insight together. And now, we are moving to the discussion panel. Uh, we have three, uh, three people joining us for the discussion. Let me briefly explain to you. We have Philip, Mr. Philip Cuddy, the honorary advisor of Wave Park, and he was the keynote speaker in the beginning. And we also have Ms. Stella Kim from William Anglis Institute in Australia. And also we have Max from Novosis. Uh, could you 
pronounce your the name of the city yes, is, is Novosibirsk. Uh, it's a yeah. very middle of Russia, and it's famously <laughs> hard to pronounce. Sorry. <laughs> Yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So we have three discussion panels and please uh, please share. Uh, okay, Miss Stella has a little bit left because of her time and we have two discussion panels. So please send us your questions. You can type in in the, in the chat room or you can just speak up. We will answer them. And Max and Philly, could you start your discussion first? Uh, yes, well, I have a question uh, that was um, somehow touched by some of the speakers. Uh, what do you think uh, would be the prospects of joining the uh, water wave park uh, or theme park technology with uh, augmented reality? Because in a way, I think that uh, such a park is already a simulation. So it simulates um, the natural environment. So do you see any additional prospects in development together with a more uh, kind of simulation of reality or augmented reality technology? So what would you share on this point? Thank you. Uh, Philip, would you like to answer? Oh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh odd for me because I've been surfing for so long, you know, for 52 years. And I know that the technology is the, uh, the change of the future. So, you know, with virtual reality and all these other things, yeah, there's definitely going to be some kind of extension of augmented reality. Um, and I, and I think like, you know, surfers who grow up inland that don't come out to the ocean, that grow up where there's a wave park and that's all that they know or that's how they start their surfing uh, life are gonna be different um, than people like me, you know, or people that are from Hawaii or people that are, you know, somewhere where there's, you know, a different level of surf. But I'm 100%, 150% behind wave park technology and what it can do and um, the different advantages that it offers. So, I, you know, for me, I'm, I'm, you know, and being part of the first uh, wave machines, you know, to watch what Wave Garden has done is just extraordinary. So I, I think it's going to, you know, uh, grow into a more uh, specific part of surfing culture and recreation. And maybe an additional question to this one. So do you think that the goal of theme parks, of uh, wave parks, should be uh, simulating reality as much as possible? Or do you think that uh, they should be optimized towards uh, some other kind of experience, not necessarily reminding uh, the real environment like 99.9%? .9%. Can it be better than the real? I don't think it can be better than the real thing mm -hmm. um, for a certain kind of experience. Like, you know, when I was at the wave park, we talked about the word stoke. And you know what that does, what that makes you, um, and that's what I meant. You know, if people learn a different definition of that, uh, then the wave park is, is is the key thing. But you know, you can't make a hundred foot wave in a wave park. You know, and, and so there's certain limits to the reality that you can create. But the actual stoke, you know, that joy that kind of uh, adrenaline rush or those things, you know, there's definitely what the wave park theme parks provide. There's definitely that experience. And that's part of the PTSD program, you know, because it, it's, it's a nature provided um, experience. But for somebody that has a limitation like that, the best place to have it is in a controlled environment. Um, but I, I think the wave parks are going to create uh, a surfing culture of their own, pretty much. 
Yeah, thank you very much. I think I mostly agree with that. It's hard to make it better than the real, but we might. Well, you know, uh, one thing like for me, like, you know, when, when I'm looking at the surfing, I'm looking to New Zealand from Malibu, you know, and I'm only looking at a certain time of year and those waves wow. come a thousand miles. And, you know, the whole uh, anticipation, the, the checking, you know, for something that comes from mother nature that you don't have control of, I think that's where it kind of separates or, or you know, when you get to the big size and those kinds of things. But, I, you know, like I said, I, I back, you know, for the Olympics, for uh, therapy or just for making people happy, the wave parks and theme parks, you know, have definitely, you know, a, a big place in the future. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Philip, uh, thank you for, thank you for the question, Max and Philip. Philip, I have one question about this surf park. As he, Max has mentioned, the reality of being this surf pool, but how about the sustainability of the wave park or surf park? Because we, before the surf park comes to the industry, there were water parks like Proslite or Whitewater has been the major industry players. And I heard that they are also making some waves for surfing. So they might come into this surf park sector. So what do you think about the future of the surf pool or surf park technology in this area? Um. You mean as far as the advancing it? Um, yes. Well, I, I actually, you know, for the wave parks that I've been to and seen, um, or if you compare yours to Kelly Slater's, I mean, you know, when you talk about the customer experience, you know, waiting all, you know, a long time for that next wave is is not a satisfactory customer experience. You know, so at the wave park, if you have fifty six different kind of modules. You have the area where the waves are breaking for the advanced surfers, and then you have the bay area inside. You know, the Shihung Wave Park has done a really good job at taking wave garden technology and adding things to it to make it a better consumer experience. Um, but it, you know, it, it. I hate to say that it's going to become like golf courses. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's 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 um, you know. There's golf courses everywhere, you know, and you become a geographical uh, bound um, destination. But then, um, then it's your marketing and your business. You know, it's like with the business that Skip and Kate, I think, you know, when, when they talk about their package deals, but uh, I think they're, they're, developing places in Hawaii is going to be different than developing places in Korea. You know, so I think you just have to be competitive with your marketing, you know, and, and um, you, you know, like in Korea, if you open up another wave park in Pusan, I don't think you're going to hurt your market in Shihung, you know, because you have different areas. And um, the thing I'm interested in with like what Su Jung is studying is, you know, that local group of Shihung community people that come to the surf park, you know, that's going to be a telling uh, development for the future of wave parks. You know, how do you uh, capture your local community? You know, because in surfing in natural places like, you know, Santa Cruz, and Huntington Beach fight over the title of Surf City. You know, so you're gonna have this, you know, different wave parks, different areas, different companies. And I think eventually you'll have competition between the people that like American Wave, between the people that like Wave Garden, you know, cause that's what I did for most of my life in surfing was competition and, you know, Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Philip. And I think Brian, you can also share your 
opinion about this sustainability? Yeah, it's um, it, it's really interesting. I just wanted to jump in and uh, say that everyone who's designing a wave pool is, you know, they're surfers first, like like Mr. Cuddy. So it's uh, designed always with a sustainable eye toward it <clears throat> because we're all connected to the ocean and that's where we learn to, to do this wonderful thing. But when you look at, uh, you break it down into three components, there's the water use, the energy use, and then the construction site itself. And a lot of times there's some interesting things going on right now with uh, converting older industrial sites into wave pools. So um, you're not taking up new ground. Uh, with this, uh, energy use, there are more energy efficient systems coming out. Uh, Wave Garden's incredibly energy efficient. And a lot of places are using on-site solar panels and uh, generating their own energy. And water use, uh, that, that tends to come in uh, only in like some of the desert areas uh, where water is an issue. Um, but yes, it's uh, more, doesn't use as much water as golf courses. I think Skip mentioned uh, one and a half golf uh, holes of golf uh, is equal to what a, a wave pool would use uh, with, within a year. So yeah, sustainable. They are more sustainable than they, they, they would appear on the surface. And yeah, I just wanted to jump in with that. Thank you, Brian, for your answers. And I think we can also talk about the tourism between Spain or other country and Korea. Philip or Max, would you like to share your opinion? Actually, can I ask you? <laughs> yes, yes, please. As I just wanted to ask you how to connect with these beginners or with this new, because for you that if, if you're already a person who knows how to surf, it's easy to see the goods on those kind of facilities. But for people that, I mean, I've surfed maybe a couple of times, I was not very good. I was just thinking that I will fall down, I will lose my clothes and my... <laughs> so it was, my idea is like, it's it's very easy to understand for, for someone who knows how to surf, but how are the others for people who are just beginners? What well, I, I taught surfing. You? You know, in Waikiki, it, it the the wave pool itself, the wave garden technology actually enhances the beginning experience. In the ocean, like in Waikiki, you know, most of your surfing is going to be from where the white water breaks, and you're going to go straight at the beach. The one thing that happens at the wave garden is because of the consistency of the wave, how they have it controlled small on the inside, a person who begins at the wave park is gonna learn how to go across the wave quicker than somebody who learns in the ocean. And the other thing is like, when you go to the ocean, most beginner places, the waves kind of flop over and don't have good shape. But because of the technology that Wave Garden has created, you know, you get that consistency of shape and also in your mind, you know that you wanna go that way. But it's marketing. Like, like my idea for marketing for Xi'an, you know, there's the, the top wave surfers, but go get somebody from a TV show that everybody watches that every, and, and bring that person to the wave park to introduce all the beginners you know, so, so they're not inhibited, but that's the one good thing about the wave cove, you know, the way they have the waves breaking outside and then the way they reform in the bay, you know, you, you know, people stay out of each other's way, you know, and so it's, it's a safer experience. So um, the wave park has a bigger advantage for teaching beginners than the ocean does. And may I ask a question to Roger about the tourism? Roger, when I saw the numbers uh, that you shown about the number of tourists traveling to Korea and to Spain, I wondered, uh, well, I mean, it's well known that uh, much more tourists visit Spain every year, but what would be the share of each country in each other's tourism? I mean, 
to compare these two numbers, it would be nice to know uh, what is the share, like how important are the tourists from Korea for Spain and vice versa. What do you think? Do you have any numbers like that? And indeed, actually, for at that time, actually, when it it closed that that much, you, I mean, every single person you 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 meet here, they had a plan to go, or they already went to Spain. So it mean in terms of let's say tourist share here in Korea, I think uh, Spain had a very big percentage of that. For like for the for the opposite for for Spanish people coming to Spain, I from to Korea. I can say that's not or was not that famous at all. I think maybe maybe there's, there was this cultural gap that now we are trying to jump. And I think the things will improve, but still and I think maybe that can connect with with uh, the idea of 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 Philip that having a program, having a drama, having something that highlights this place, bringing normal people at that time were just like, they call it the four Joshis that they went to Spain, they just show up how how they enjoy the, the everything, the experience, right? And I think that really improved the visibility of the country and how people talk, okay, if they do it, if they, it's not that far, it seems a lot of fun. And I think that would be a good point to improve for the wave garden experience or for so oh, but in terms of numbers I don't have the numbers just think that would be the, the answer okay yeah sorry uh, actually may I add to that uh, probably that's a question for everyone I'm not uh, an expert in tourism but as far as I understand there is uh, such a uh, parameter that kind of characterizes each country and each tourist experience as revisitability. So if you've been there once, would you go there another time? Do you expect uh, a different experience at the same place? So what would you say uh, about uh, a theme park, a wave park like that? I mean, is it better in that parameter than a traditional tourist destinations, tourist experience? Is it worse? Or maybe some additional work has to be done so that people want to go again and uh, kind of revisit, but expecting something different. Because I think that's important. Because otherwise, as you say, after all people from Korea visit Spain once, they just don't go there very often again. What do you think, uh, everyone? Just um, in my experience, this is also a very good question, indeed. Uh, it's true. The first thing that people go to when they visit Spain is to visit Barcelona, Madrid. And that would be the first thing. And I think um, the country itself and all these uh, tourist agencies, and they have to be very creative and highlighting not just, there is not just the city, there is not just Gaudí, but different experiences. And I think that we'll be working with all the tourist areas with all these facilities. For example, we have Universal Portaventura, or we have Salo, and we have different places that people just go there without visiting Barcelona. So that would be the good, a good idea to highlight you have also those places, and I think this is good to work on. Uh, can I add some additional comment. Yeah, I agree with the Roga and yeah, absolutely the revisiting is very important. And in my opinion, I think the city, how can I say, like uh, Spain, if someone visits Spain, Barcelona, they prefer visit another city. So in Korea as well, if people, most of visitors will firstly visit Seoul, but they might need to we need to promote other cities to them. So they might want to visit Sihun or Busan in next time. So promoting and marketing each city, small city will be important to make higher revisit, to revisit higher revisit. You know, I have uh, a, a lot of ideas about the tourism. Um, 
you know, like for people from Spain, there's a surfing place called Mundaka and it, it's really good. Let's say there's a group of surfers that are top surfers that want to go to Indonesia. And let's say they want to come and they know the wave park is in Shihung. Any surfer that knows that they're guaranteed to get waves mm. is going to want to go to that destination. Mm. Now, one of the ideas I had is if people would do a survey of the flights at the airport that were going to other surf destinations, they could offer, you know, a layover. People that are on layovers could go to Shihung Wave Park, surf for a couple hours, eat, get a shower, and then go back on the plane. But then you have to deal with the tourism and the government and, and that kind of thing. Um, then there's also, you know, destination surfing tourism where a surfing family could come to Korea for a week. And let's say they know they would surf at Shihung Wave Park for three days. Then they could go to Yangyang, they could go to Hyundai, they could go the rest of the country and know that they're going to surf and they might get other surf. So I think the COVID or the black swan really put a, a, a obstacle in the way of how the wave park could develop. And I think right now from, you know, being an honorary advisor and knowing surf industry, I think it's, it's just a matter of time before this black cloud, black swan goes away. Cause you know, first time I went to Korea was 1973. I lived in Korea for two years. A few years ago when I found out that Korea was the top 10, Seoul was the top 10 destinations for European travelers. I was shocked. But you know, there's a whole, there's a whole, I think there's a whole group of people around the world that are waiting to experience Korea more. And then what America did through Donald Trump, through North Korea, you know, to the way people saw Korea outside of the, the peninsula, I think that hurt too. So I think there's a lot of things, but I think it's good that, you know, like Su Jung and 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 Professor um, part are, are studying tourism, you know, studying the effects because, um, you know, I have a lot of friends here that want to come to surf the wave park. You know, they just want to experience it. And I know when they go experience the rest of Korea, because um, there's a lot of things that, you know, I mean, people that like art, you know, so you just have to ha combine all these things that are great about Korea with the wave park or with whatever theme park or whatever you're trying to do but uh, i think it's just the COVID thing that's really um complicated things okay thank you and i think we don't uh do we have another questions for the panel or speakers please ask your last question And if you have questions, uh, I think we can wrap up here. Uh, and if you have questions, we didn't get to today, please share your questions through email. Uh, I will share the email address with you. This is the uh, ICAPS conference email. So you, if you want to share your feedback or questions, you can share anytime. And also last, announcement uh, we are now calling for papers for the june and september edition of our book so please go to our website and uh and if you have any papers to share please share with us and lastly we would like to announce the the best presentation of today our organizing committee has voted for the best and then we have, we would like to award Mr. Lose Lawyer for your presentation. So uh, we will provide you the gift of Wave Park surfing ticket. Yes, for I think you have mentioned that you are the beginner, so we'll give you the beginner sessions. <laughs> and I don't deserve it, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Okay.
And also, we, we don't have much people left at the end of the conference. So, but we still want to share this gift from Wave Park. And because of COVID, I think some of you are staying in America or Russia. So we'll choose some Koreans. <laughs> and so, so we have... This is totally reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> but next time, we will make sure that if you visit Korea, we'll of course invite you to Wave Park. <laughs> uh, we have Yu um, Dongor-nim, yes. Uh, and our speaker, uh, Professor Sujan Kim and Hwang Mijang Nim will give you the Wake Park uh, entrance and surfing, surfing uh, tickets. And also, yes, I think that's it for our conference, the second, of, second annual conference of ITEPS. And thank you for joining today. You, uh, some of you are staying in America, so you're staying up very late. It's two o'clock in, in, in the morning. And thank you for joining and staying until the last session of conference. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Bye. Bye everyone. It was a pleasure.